It was Moses' aid. Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm going to give to them. To the Israelites, I will give to you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. And your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the great sea on the west. And no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Here's the passing of the torch, and God is saying, I will be just as faithful to you and just as powerful through you as I was with Moses. Now, wouldn't that be an encouragement? But there's something lacking in Joshua. What is it? Courage. He's like the lion in the Wizard of Oz. He doesn't have any courage. Look at verse 6. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And then verse 8, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Now be strong and courageous. He's three times mentioned this word courage to him so far because uh, this is the one thing that Joshua doesn't have. He will get it, but right now he doesn't have it. Okay, now, but Joshua learned something. He learned a very important lesson, and that is you don't send 12 spies into the land and you don't make it a public event. You pick two guys and you privately say, you two guys go spy out the land and when you find out you come back to me and talk to me. He doesn't want to repeat of 40 years before that, does he? And so in chapter 2 he's going to secretly send two spies into the land. Okay. All right, um, you'll notice uh, there's, uh, that's in chapter 2. In chapter 3 are the crossing instructions, and they're going to cross at flood stage. Isn't that neat of God to pick the most inconvenient time <laughs> to cross? And so God picks the flood stage for them to cross the land. And so, they're gonna, and, and so God is going to pile the waters up. He's going to pile the waters. You know, I don't know what the volume in flood stage is, coming down that river, but what's happening is he's piling the waters up, which is the same as saying we have dammed up the water, and now guess what? Way upstream, people are saying, hey, how come the water's coming back? Way upstream, don't you know, they're saying to themselves, uh, what is going on downstream? These waters are backing up. And I'll bet they had, you know, flooded this and flooded that and flooded something else. And, and I'll bet they sent uh, people to investigate. Wouldn't you love to have been there and, and just been kind of hiding in a bush and listened as these people came and said, it's a whole group of people, looks like about two million. And King, I don't understand it, but we got so far, and then the waters were standing straight up. And they couldn't flow anymore. Wouldn't you love to have been there and poked your finger in to see if it makes a leak? <laughs> I would have. So they go there, and the first thing that they're going to do is they go to, they're going to go to Jericho, but first they have these memorial stones, and they put stones in the middle of the river, and then they're going to put stones on the other side of the river, and they're going, these are memorial stones. Well, what in the world do you have memorial stones for? It's there for them to remember, hence the word memorial stones. 
these 12 stones. Don't you know that God made the water stand up? You bring your great, great grandson here and say, great grandson, now right here, you see this pile of rock? Now that's where the water stood up and we all crossed on dry ground. And you're going to pass this thing on for generation after generation. You're going to pe bring people to the pile of stones and you're going to tell them what happened right here. And you ought to learn something from that. And as God wants all of us to have a few memorial piles in our life where you come back to and you tell your children, I want to tell you what happened in 1985. I want to tell you what happened in 2007. Now that was a year when God stepped into this family and he did something for us. And you ought to have that marked down. It doesn't have to be a pile of stones, but it ought to be something visible. You can take your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren too, and say, this was the faithfulness of God to us. And he's the same God, and he will be faithful to you. And that's, I think, an extremely important thing we learn from this. They renew the covenant. Once they get across, they will renew the covenant. And uh, they'll put those um, things, and there are four... Uh, four things here. Uh, first thing is that uh, they circumcise the males. Apparently they've uh, not been doing that in the, in the previous years. So they uh, circumcise the males. This is all part of renewing the covenant that they have with God. And then they celebrate the Passover. They haven't been celebrating the Passover. Now they're in the land. And then here's a neat thing. And look at chapter 5, verse 12. Somebody read that for me. Chapter 5, verse 12. When the manna flew from the day, <coughs> when the manna flew from the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, for they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Isn't that something? God says, okay, I'm done providing the meals. Now you've got to go back to work. Got to put food on the table. I'm done. I'm done, done providing the free meals from heaven. You're in the land where I said you would be. Now it's time for you to go to work. You're, you're to go eat the produce of the land. And of course, what they're going to first eat is what other people have planted. So that, that was still a pretty good deal. And then I want you to look at chapter 5, verse 13. Okay, here you see they've crossed the Jordan. They're ready to occupy the promised land God had given to them. And they're ready to go and, and do this in the power of the Lord. And, and uh, they have kept their part of the covenant. And they've uh, reinstituted Passover and the circumcision. And they've um, uh, put these stones up and, and all this sort of thing. And now, you'll notice in chapter... Um, what did I say? 5, verse 13. Okay, what does that say? I didn't put it in your notes there, but what does it say? There's a meeting. Joshua goes out, you know, and he sees a man, and he's, he's thinking, oh no, is he my enemy, or is he, uh, is he an okay guy? And uh, so, um, look at verse 13 now. When Joshua was near Jericho, he, saw, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said, are, are you for us or for our enemy? Neither one. Uh-oh. <laughs> but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? And what is the answer? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals. For the place where you're standing is holy ground. And immediately his mind would go back to a similar experience with of whom? Moses. And just as Moses began his ministry at a burning bush on holy ground, Joshua will now begin his ministry with the presence of the Lord on holy ground. Isn't that wonderful? I just, it just almost sends chills down my spine when I think about that the, the commander of the Lord's host came there and he said, you know, the question is not 
whether or not that I'm on your side. The question is whether or not you're on my side. And not, not my for your enemy or my for you, but I, I'm the one leading the show, and I am the commander of the Lord's hosts, and I, in fact, am the one that I'm going to win all your battles. I'm going to fight for you. If I was Joshua at that point, I'd take this deep breath and this sigh of relief and I'd say, thank you God for this little meeting that you've had with me. I, I, I'm starting to get my courage back. Right? I'm starting to feel it now. Then they have a central campaign. They go to Jericho. And then in great haste, they head on to Ai. Only they're defeated at Ai. Somebody tell me, why were they defeated at Ai? Because a guy named Achan stole some things at Jericho, and he thought nobody knew it, and he hid some things, and God would not let the rest of the nation succeed. And he stopped the victory dead in its tracks. And the man who was guilty was found out, and he had to be executed. His family. We had a question. That would have been a pre-incarnate form of Jesus. Now, what they do at this point after Ai, and after the final victory with Ai, they finally do have victory at Ai, but only after the sin of Achan is dealt with. And then they go to a place at Shechem. Do you remember we've mentioned Shechem several times? Do you remember that was the first place when, where that Abraham offered? Okay. And now it's the place of renewing what uh, we're just going to call the suzerainty covenant the vassal su uh, suzerain covenant that God is establishing between uh, Israel and himself. And he uses a form of covenant which is in vogue in the day and a part